Now on RTE Radio 1, we remember Arthur Griffith on the 100th anniversary of his death. Here's John Bowman. Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, a special edition to mark the centenary of a major Irish historical figure who died just 100 years ago. As the Civil War was in its earliest weeks, Arthur Griffith, President of Thaw Aaron and a key member of the fledgling Government of the Irish Free State died of a heart attack. A leader in advanced nationalism right down to the days of the treaty. One of the greatest. My opinion, Griffith was the greatest Irish friend I ever met. Griffith had many unorthodox views. He was original and an autodidact who educated himself as a voracious reader throughout his life. Griffith was born in 1871, died 12th of August 1922. These are among the traces of Griffith in the RTE Sound Archives. And we begin with this fragment from his daughter, Eta Griffith Gray, recalling a black and tan raid on their home in 1920 at the height of the War of Independence, but also at a time when many were supporting the idea of some negotiated settlement between the Irish and London. I remember a dreadful, dreadful uh, raid on the house. It would be the black and tans. We lived in St Lawrence Road in Clantoff. This is probably a reference to Griffith's arrest on the 26th of November 1920, just a week after the events of Bloody Sunday. Mark Sturgis, in his Dublin Castle diary, notes that he had heard from London on the telephone that Lloyd George was not best pleased. And the British newspapers also appreciated that Griffith was recognised as among the Irish leaders who might prove a pragmatist. And... uh... I remember they'd been thrown out of bed one night. I must have been about six or something. And the mattress was, uh, they tore it up with a knife. And then they looked up the chimney and that. And then there was a lot of noise outside and I rushed to the window. They had my father tied to a tree. There were trees on the road. And I heard my mother saying, where are you taking him to? And I heard the reply, which lived with me all my life. Uh, They said, oh, to shoot or hang him which he jolly well deserves. Griffith Griffith had his own ideas about a political settlement with England. Historian and contemporary, Lowen O'Brien. Which was not not certainly superficially the same thing as an independent democratic republic. And uh, he pursued his own line. But he was recognised to be, as somebody says, the the supreme separatist. And um, his his position was undoubtedly recognised to be the position of a leader in advanced nationalism right down to the, the days of the treaty. One central idea which originated with Arthur Griffith was that Irish self-government and separation from Britain could be achieved by the instrument of using what was then a Westminster election to stand on a platform of self-determination, stand as abstentionist candidates, with the promise that if elected, they would refuse their seats at Westminster, assemble in Dublin and declare their independence. And this is the origin of Thole Aaron, derived from the successful application of this principle at the 1918 election. I think people definitely have uh, overlooked Arthur Griffith. His latest biographer, Colm Kenny. Because he makes the picture much more complicated. The kind of easy narrative of independence is made more difficult. This is the man who founded Sinn Féin, who sustained Sinn Féin until after the 1916 rebellion, who was there with the IRB in 1914 at the beginning of the First World War, planning what was to happen during the First World War, who yielded gracefully to de Valera in 1918 because he knew the young bloods wanted a different kind of person in charge, but almost immediately took over as president of the Doyle for most of the War of Independence when de Valera went to America. And then he leads the treaty delegation and he's president of the Doyle in 1921. So why do we not know a lot more about him? Colm Kenny, author of The Enigma of Arthur Griffith, a contemporary with Podrick Colm. Griffith, a strongly built, friendly, but rather impassive man. He had a moustache above a broad chin. He wore magnifying glasses before remarkably steady eyes. He was a splendid man to be with on tramps through the country. He could go on for hours with a deliberate gait, talking in a rather low voice about people and places. He knew everything about the local history of Dublin and places adjoining, and he could keep on talking, often with great humour, about events that had happened on the streets or upon the hillside. He was a Dublin man, loving the city, 
as men might have loved Athens or Florence. His background was pretty impoverished, working class Dublin. Historian Dermot Ferreter. He was educated by the Christian Brothers in inner city Dublin to the age of 13. His father was a printer. And then he went into the printing trade. He was an apprentice. That was common for, for the sons of printers at that time. He was very much a nationalist who thought in economic as well as political terms. So that background in working class Dublin had a, a, a serious influence on him. But it also radicalised him to a degree. Whilst he was seen as, as more moderate than many uh, of his contemporaries at a later stage, he did have that edge in relation to the kind of poverty that he was familiar with in Dublin and, and the urban poverty. Liam O'Brien would get to know Griffith better, later, as we will hear presently, but first encountered Griffith when O'Brien was still a boy. Queen Victoria came to Dublin, gave uh, a breakfast to all the loyal children in the Phoenix Park, all lined along the, the main road of the Phoenix Park. I was up there, I saw the old dame passing by, but I wasn't invited to the breakfast. And then the, the not the Sinn Féiners, the word wasn't in use, but the pre-Sinn Féiners, the prehistoric Sinn Féiners at the time, Arthur Griffin, some others, got up a patriotic children's treat. That's for all the children who refused the Queen's breakfast. And 30,000 young urchins gathered at the back of the custom house and we were matched at Clontarf Park. While waiting at the custom house, I saw this little man getting up on an outside car, I think along with Maud Gunn and some others, I don't know whom, probably some of his old cronies like Alderman Tom Kelly or Tom Shane Cuff or others. And he was a prolific and influential journalist. He believed and plausibly demonstrated to many that the pen could be mightier than the sword. Patrick Cullum envied him his facility as a writer. He wrote his articles with a pencil upon long slips of rough paper. He would take his pencil in hand exactly at 12 o'clock. He would write without lifting his head. He would finish just as the hand finished the round of the clock. Then he would lift up his arms and stretch out his legs as if to say, well, that job's finished. As a youthful probationer in the profession of writing, I used to envy him his power of concentration. Uh, he was eventually persuaded to come back to Ireland to continue as a journalist when William Rooney founded the United Irishman newspaper and of course he really found his feet there as an extraordinary journalist and he was, we forget this sometimes, the range of his expertise, of his reading. Uh, he was always making international comparisons. He was churning out statistics and examples about what small countries could do with independence and with economic independence in particular. He was vituperative. He was very aggressive. That was the style of journalism of that era. And he didn't suffer any fools. Griffith himself did not participate in the Easter Rising, but he was arrested in its aftermath as a senior Sinn Féin figure. Colm Kenny. What actually happens, uh, it is true that Sinn Féin gets the credit, if you like, for a rebellion in which Sinn Féin as such wasn't as central as some more radical elements in the Republican movement. But Griffin himself had been at a very important meeting in 1914 that was called by Sean Theo Kelly of the IRB leadership, which sketched out what was going to happen during the war in resisting the British, including um, plans for a revolt. Um, and most of the people at that meeting died very soon afterwards in one, of the, one way or the other, many of them, of course, being executed in 1916. But at that meeting, Griffith is given the task it's he's spoken to about continuing the propaganda struggle. And he had the qualities, as we've seen, to be a brilliant propagandist. And the British sent him to Wandsworth Jail in England, along with the 1916 prisoners, but kept apart from them by the authorities. Liam O'Brien, himself arrested after the rising for his part in it, also found himself in Wandsworth Jail, as he told Kieran Sheedy. In Wandsworth Jail, he was in Wandsworth Jail, but he was kept apart from us. He was kept apart from us in the book of, of the of the prisoners walking around the ring. He was kept in another part of the of the prison. I didn't. I wasn't talking to him there yes. at all. What did, What did the rest of the prisoners think? A about uh, McNeil's part and Griffith's part when they weren't, you know, they didn't actually fight. Does, does there was no, they, as far as I could see at the time, talking to many of the people there in Wandsworth Jail, and especially later on in Frangach. There was no bitterness about that among all the men that had been fighting. They said, this was a sane measure, this was common sense, to say this was uh, this was what any sane man would think, he hadn't a chance, which had been over in a few days. All the bright hopes that we cherished had come to an end, as Balmer mm -hmm. Hobson had foretold. To see, foretold in a speech he made a week before the raging, said, you'll hold out for a week. Did they expect to hold out longer? Oh, no, just the original ideas were uh, 
a landing in Kerry, these arms distributed. Yeah, but when, the, when that the, fell through... To the Cork Brigade, mm -hmm. going up to uh, Clare and all that. Mm -hmm. Oh, when that fell through, yes, they went out, mm -hmm. Connolly said to Bill O'Brien, when they went out in Montabari, no chance, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then going out to a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Mike Dermott was supposed to said we'll hold Dublin for a weekend. If we do that, we'll have succeeded. Yes, he's, yeah. yes, he said something like that, sure. Mm -hmm. And Pierce also was at this general... Yes, oh, yes, they, they, they were all clear mm -hmm. that it was better to make a... to strike a blow than, uh, than not to, mm -hmm. you see, when all that was done. You see, they were full of tradition. Mm -hmm. You see, they were full of the history of the Fenians and all that. If we come back to the period yes. after 1916, when, when Griffith were and, and yeah. some of the prisoners were released and the Sinn Féin Convention 1917, yeah. if we take that period, yes. from there up to the treaty... I, uh, was, I was very friend, intimate and a constant companion of Griffith during these years. Were you? Yes. Beginning in what capacity? After, after each two weeks coming back, just uh, individually, mm -hmm. you see, not in any capacity, official capacity at all. Mm -hmm. But you'd be, of course, I went to live in Galway in 1917, but every time I'd come up, I'd meet the boys there. Yes. I, I, I think myself that, that even though the proclamation of the Republic, that Griffith never really believed in the Republic, even in his speeches after he came back, it's very, very few occasions that you read, you know, he's talking about the full independence of the country, but he very rarely specifically mentions the word Republic. No, the, uh, the position was this. Griffith had an organisation, the Sinn Féin organisation, which was in existence for ten years before Easter week. More of which he, were, he had been, he was president, and all that which was keeping alive. After the rising, all the people flocked into Sinn Fein. They all said the the, the, the Sinn Fein is rising. They all uh, ignored, so to speak, the word republic or republican and all that. And everybody came into Sinn Fein, and and they all, uh, when the other prisoners, the prisoners who were doing the long term sentences, came back in May 1917, they found uh, this was there. Sinn Fein was all over that place. Count Plunkett had called uh, a conference on his own hook having gathered a committee around him, and uh, his conference in the Mansion House, crowded congr uh, conference that I was present at, to see oh, Sinn Féin they wanted. Griffith was there, and Griffith at one moment he said to Count Plunkett, all right, I'll carry on my organisation as before. Oh, and I then didn't. somebody mm -hmm. called for a conference <coughs> between him and Father Michael O'Flanagan, and it was all picked up. And uh, the... the, the the, 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 the leaders of the Rising, or the surviving officers of the Rising who came out of jail, found they couldn't ignore the Sinn Féin movement. They had to join it. There was a join up, a link up. But and still, this, Griffith this, put this, in, this. yes, mm -hmm. that, the, the, that Griffith had to submit to the tide of enthusiasm for the, for the, for the, for the Easter week, for the Easter week proclamation and for the Republic. Liam O'Brien, in the aftermath of the Rising, Griffith ceded the presidency of Sinn Féin to Eamon de Valera himself becoming vice president. He was also acting president during de Valera's 18 months in America. Griffith preferred the passive resistance model to any resort to physical force. P.S.O. Hegarty wrote of him, I believe that the shooting, the ambush, and the savagery and the moral collapse which they generated sickened his soul and then his body. And he was pleased that this phase of the war had begun while he was in prison. Griffith was chosen to lead the delegation to the treaty talks in London in October 1921, which resulted in the controversial Anglo-Irish Treaty. This is Lone O'Brien's take on the wide range of expectations among de Valera's cabinet during these crucial weeks. So the cabinet, the, the cabinet of Dáleiran, with de Valera as his president and Collins as one of his members, Griffith, Brew, and somebody, they had been discussing the the possibility of an agreement with the British. The Republic, presumably, was not an in issue. It was a question of getting the best possible settlement based upon Dominion status. And they went to London, really, to explore the possibility of some form of settlement along those lines. Now, it was there, that, that, that they were there in, in London for about seven weeks. The people who had remained behind, notably Brew and Stack, were very, very chary of this, of the possibility that the Republican ideal would be lost and that the settlement based into, uh, uh, only on the dominion status that they were aware of and uh, wouldn't work. And there were, there were of course, uh, Erskine Childers, who was very much in the, very much, uh, in the, in the middle of the stage, advising Devil Air on various things, uh, it was insisting that there could be no dominion settlement of in, in, in the Irish case similar to that of Canada and South Africa. 
Australia and so on, because of, he kept on insisting Ireland is too near Britain and Britain will give us a different sort of deal. Now actually, he, he, I'm sure that he was completely wrong about that. But at that time it was a, it was a, a fair idea and uh, he hammered it home so hard in and off the stage that it, uh, it frightened Griffith and Collins in London. They felt that their hands had, had been tied unduly. That something really good, a good bargain was emerging. And then they, they got, you got to speculate then what was happening in the cabinet. That to what extent de Valera uh, succumbed, was taken over by the, by the Brew Stack Childers thinking. What's your own view? Well, my own view is that the, uh, very definitely, that the Collins had made, um, had made up the mind that uh, the settlement on the Dominion status was was the thing to accept. That he would he he endeavoured to get the most out of it as was possible. And this uh, he's, he, he the settlement the actual treaty itself was he aimed at supplementing it by strengthening it, it by producing a constitution which in, in improved very much the basic treaty document. And uh, I, I think that he intended to push as hard as he could to recovering by means of Dominion Estates the Republican position. Lono Bryn, Lord Longford, Frank Pakenham, who wrote the hugely influential book on the treaty, Peace by Ordeal, and would later co-author De Valera's biography, would take a different view, and indeed in this archive interview argues that it was Griffith who influenced Collins to sign the controversial document. I personally believe, and this is mere so much, I've never said it and never written it, and it's, perhaps I shall change my opinion again, but I would personally have thought if Arthur Griffiths hadn't said in London, I will sign if nobody else does, I can't imagine that Collins would have taken that line. In other words, he was such a great man in the end for unity, I would have thought, as, as was proved in the months that followed, that his instinct was to seek uh, unity among his own uh, people, that I can't see him uh, playing um, his part in what was bound to be a split. But of course his loyalty to Griffith was another very strong uh, motive, and um, when Griffith said he, um, he would do it, um, Collins said he'll do the same. But um, my own feeling is that if Griffith had done the normal thing and uh, said that he must go back to Dublin, and um, then the, the Collins would have um, uh, would have come back with him. and. And then, well, who knows what would happen there, but I can't, uh, I can't see him taking that line that Griffiths took. And Maura Comerford, many years later, explained how she and her comrades who denounced the treaty read so much of this historical moment so differently. Can you remember the evening at the time of the treaty? Can you remember your emotions or feelings? Oh, yes. It was, uh, there was a little paragraph in the, uh, in the morning papers in, in, the, in, in the latest news box to say that something had been signed. And, because uh, we didn't know what it was, something had been signed in London. I remember being in uh, meeting P.S.O. Hegarty and he put me in his book afterwards and said that I had rejoiced over the signing of the treaty. It is true that I met him, but uh, we, had, uh, we had no idea what was in the treaty until that uh, afternoon, until the evening papers came. And that was a dreadful blow, absolutely dreadful blow in the mansion house that night at a, the Dante commemoration, 500th commemoration. It was a big occasion for the, uh, the Minister for Cultural Relations of Dalair and Count Plunkett. And also in the supper room there was the, the uh, Enoch Nanalik was going on. So um, I saw De Valera coming back from, from, uh, from Limerick. He was arriving in and he got this letter, which was the terms of the treaty, and it had already been in the evening papers, but uh, he got this letter. He hadn't been given the courtesy of having it before it was published. And then I, I left the thing, the Dante thing. He was sitting on a platform there and everything looking very glum, but this uh, concert was going on. And I went into Enoch Manolik, and uh, there you just went through and you talked to your friends and you found people that you agreed with and people that you would probably never speak to again. The cleavage was so complete. That was a Just, sad time. Oh, it was a dreadful time. It was a dreadful day. And then it went from bad to worse, of course, all the time. But I have been reading, just quite lately, I've been reading the Dahl debates the day after the treaty was 
accepted, as you know, by a majority of 57 to 64, 64 to 57, very small majority, and one reading it was accepted, and then they all met again. And that day's debate is extremely interesting. It shows the, the goodwill there was to try and hold the Republican movement together, to try and, and, uh, and stop a split and try not to have fighting. It's very striking. I think it's interesting, too, that I suppose 99% of the women went anti treaty at the time. Could you account for this? Well, we were all for the Republic. Um, you see, the, the politicians at that debate I was talking about, uh, De Valera said that he had been trying to prepare the Dal for a compromise. Didn't say it in so many words, but that was what it was. It was uh, the leadership apparently recognized that they, they would do something which was a compromise. But we who were in the Republican forces, particularly in the volunteers or Kumanaman, we had been kept going by the assurance um, all the time that we were defending an established government and and uh, it, it was democratically elected, it was established, and it would never be given away. Back now to Liam O'Brien's testimony and what he told Kieran Sheedy about Griffith's response to the hostility which so many felt about the outcome. He was very surprised and uh, very surprised and shook, if you like. They were, they were, both he and Collins were very uh, disappointed, felt that the position would have been understood better, felt that they had done the job they were sent to do. They felt that they, that they had, that they had uh, carried out their undertakings. They felt that they had submitted to the Cabinet all they were prepared to take. Do you we had a great walk with Griffith, some of us, uh, oh, about a week or so after he came back. Uh, we went out, three or four of us, Sean Melroy was there, and I think Michael Nike uh, uh, was there, and uh, out in the hills. We went, we went into the Lamb Dials, up in the hills, for a little refreshment, not much, and there he gave us a very vivid description of all the, of the whole treaty business, and, and uh, all the meetings, and so on, so what the men were like over there, the Englishmen and all that, enormously impressed by the brains of uh, Birkenhead, they say and by apparently the honesty of Austin Chamberlain. Is it? And of think course of the cleverness of, uh, Lloyd, of George. Lloyd George. Yes. Mm-hmm. Churchill, of course, Solary. I don't think Churchill was so prominent in the treaty negotiations as mm-hmm. so he came mm-hmm. later. But, uh, but he was there, of course, <laughs> with the Navy in one hand and the Army in the other. <laughs> do you remember Do you remember the, the, the Griffith during the, the debate, the treaty debate? Yes, I do. Well, mm-hmm. I met him. Well, on the night uh, the thing was passed, I was with him. You see, that night went home with him out to Clontarf. But he was very satisfied. Uh, the, uh, he made a big speech there in the doll, and he uh, he was satisfied with that speech, his last final speech. Oh, yes, he felt his, his job was done. Looking back on Griffith's career, O'Brien reckoned that his clarity of thought was one of his greatest strengths. Griffith had that, a good flow of very... After all, he was a very practised master of English. He was in, his, in his paper... People have compared him to Swift in places. There's some wonderful writing. I think James Stevens has called him the best prose writer of the, of the period. Yes, mm-hmm. he was a great prose writer. Mm-hmm. And that man, in his speeches, he came out, uh, he came out, you see, with that clarity and straightness and simplicity without any tricks, no waving of hands. Or he was a better speaker than Devon Lear. O'Brien always thought of Griffith as essentially a Dubliner. He, he was very, very much of a Dublin man in every way, very companionable, ready to... Uh, make friends with anybody and everybody. Within months of the treaty controversy and with the outbreak of civil war over its terms, Griffith died of a heart attack on the 12th of August, 1922. One of the greatest. My opinion, Griffith was the greatest Irish friend I ever met. Liam O'Brien. Historian Michael Laffin in the Dictionary of Irish Biography suggests that Griffith seemed already a father figure to the younger men around him, a relic of an earlier age. He died despondent, believing that many of his achievements were being undone and that his old suspicion of bloodshed had been vindicated at last. And Laffin says he died as he had lived a poor man and he concludes that after the Civil War he was almost forgotten by his ungrateful pro-treaty colleagues. There was a terrible battle that his widow Maud had to fight in the immediate aftermath of his death in 1922. Dermot Ferriter. 
just to get the government of the day to recognise him. They had given her £100 to deal with funeral expenses and so on, but she was looking for proper compensation. And the way she put it was that he made you all. And she had to beg to get a pension. She eventually got a pension of £500 a year, which was taxed. She was furious and her sorrow turned to rage. And she was making the very point that you have forgotten the individual who made so much of what you now have possible. One of the reasons for that neglect has to do with his attachment to the idea of passive resistance. He wasn't a pacifist, but he didn't believe the military strategy that had been undertaken by uh, the Republicans was the right way to go. We went along with it to a certain extent. He wasn't in favour of the 1916 Rising, for example. So in a sense, because of the polarities of the Civil War era, his layers, his nuances, his complex approach to Irish nationalism and to the state and to the idea of the nation tended to be overlooked in favour of those strident Civil War positions. And a postscript from his biographer, Colm Kenny. Griffith did say during the treaty discussions to his wife, or his wife said he said, that he was wanted to get out of politics. But I doubt he, he would have actually done that. I, I think he would have continued to be a moderating force and he would have tried to apply social and economic principles and we would have had a more constructive 1920s than we did had Arthur Griffith lived. This morning's programme was based on original programmes by Kieran Sheedy, Kevin O'Connor, Sean O'Rourke, Miles Duncan, Podrick Cullum, Porica Rahali, Dermot Ferreter and Colm Kenny whose biography, The Enigma of Arthur Griffith, Father of Us All, is published by Blackwell. Thanks also to Robert Canning. Next Sunday morning, the centenary of Michael Collins, who died just days after Griffith in 1922. But he decided, after a terrible experience in 1916, that an open war against the British was bound to fail. This was a movement that wasn't penetrated by spies. We penetrated theirs, and that was Collins. Well, he was a formidable person. There's no doubt at all about this. So do join us next Sunday, and thank you for listening this morning, and good morning.